Uh, I'd like to call the Historic Preservation Commission meeting to order for um, March 10th, 2022. And uh, we need a call of order, D. Marlene Newman. Doug Bruce. Daniel Schlegel. Here. Sam DeSoller. Here. Here. Matthew Seddon. Here. John Saunders. Here. Elizabeth Mitchell. Allison Chopra. Here. Bernard Cross. Duncan Campbell. Derek. Duncan Campbell. Oh, uh, oh no. Give me a second. I just we just had our first hiccup. Give me one second. Sorry, council chambers. More. Um, make call post, yes. Um, sorry, this <laughs> is technology. Um, okay, now. Duncan Campbell. Here. Mm. Lori, I can see Duncan on. Um, okay. Hi, Duncan. Can you hear us? And can you yes. Um, unmute? Yes, I can hear. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, so he's talking, but we don't have him on. This. Are our speakers turned down in here that we can't hear people? Ah, okay. Yeah, it could be. Um, are this, can we hear the people who are via Zoom from here? Um, yeah, you, we want to. Um, we want to change this to here. Ah, okay. Now can we hear at the far end? Testing. Okay. Yeah, we can hear. Okay, Duncan, can you say something? I just said that I can hear you. Can Excellent. You hear me? Yeah, we can okay. hear you now. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Derek Ritzy. Ernesto Castaneda. Here. Chris Sturbaum. All right, let's uh, move on to uh, approval of minutes from the February 24th meeting. I'll need a motion. Move to approve. Second. D, the Dan roll call. Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Sam DeSoller. Yes. Matthew Seddon. Yes. John Saunders. Yes. Allison Chopra. Yes. All right. Motion carries. Very good. Uh, let's move on to uh, the COAs. Uh, staff approval, COA 22-21. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Today we have, uh, we are going to start with COA 22-21 for the installation of a, of a backyard and front yard fence at 621 West 7th Street. Um, the petitioners, Ian and Kathleen Bensberg, requested a four foot picket fence construction in the front yard and a six foot vertical wood board construction um, fence in the backyard. Um, the staff originally found that 
sorry, give me one second. The staff originally found that um, everything complied with the um, near west side guidelines. However, let me. However, um, it turns out that uh, Commissioner Chris Sturbaum indicated that um, it is not in the near west side historic uh, conservation district after all, but rather in the Fairview historic district, which has, um, does not allow for fencing in the front yard, only in the backyard, and starting midway towards the back of the house. So um, that happened this morning. Uh, staff contacted our legal department, contacted the owners, the petitioners, and um, able to revise the COA for um, it only to cover the back and send in, uh, useful information to the owners so that they can from now on um, work with their property through the Fairview guidelines rather than the um, near west side guidelines. And the near west side um, committee commission, um, sorry, Construction Subcommittee had even commented on the project as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at with COA 22-21, um, a staff approval that was revised today. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, so let's move on to our commission reviews, uh, COA 22-16. COA 22-16 um, calls for the, the petitioners are asking for the removal of a chimney at 701 South Valentine Road in the Elm Heights Historic District. Jonathan Fiedler and Jennifer Schopf, sorry if I am butchering your names, um, are requesting the partial demolition or the removal, full removal of the chimney. Um, the chimney is not in a very viewable section of the roof. Um, However, staff did comment that demolition in the Elm Heights Historic District is highly encouraged unless the structure presents a public threat or has been damaged due to a natural disaster. And staff found that it needed more information as to why the chimney is being condemned, if there are options to keep it. Um, however, the Neighborhood um, Construction Subcommittee um, give the removal their full endorsement due to the placement of this chimney inside center of the house. We feel it is very minimal to the house's design. This house is also at the highest point of the neighborhood, so it can barely be seen from the street or anywhere else in the area. So um, taking that into consideration, um, here's another image of the house. Um, or the, the plan, sorry and an image of the house. You can see the chimney is um, somewhat covered by trees, but that's neither here nor there. It's in, kind of in the middle of the house. It's also causing problems in the internal layout. Um, staff did not... Um, uh, pardon me, Gloria. Um, we just were talking. We want to make sure that we're, we're recording the meeting. Uh, is it recording on your end, the Zoom? Um, I believe Klox is in charge of that right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, pardon the interruption. Uh, Katz is on, so if that's, if we're good there, then we're okay. We just, yeah. as we all get used to new technology. So, okay, thank you. Yes, so where were we? So um, staff felt ambivalent and wanted more information before making a decision. However, this was before the Neighborhood, Associa um, Neighborhood Association Construction Subcommittee provided feedback fully endorsing this. Therefore, um, staff endorse, um, um, recommends the approval of the removal of the chimney. Um, and that's where I will leave it. Sorry. Thank you, Gloria. Um, let's do questions. Uh, let's start out with um, let's start out with Matthew. Well, I, I actually am kind of curious why why they want to remove the chimney. Um, so. Okay, I'm looking at the packet and it actually says the current chimney stack has been condemned. So who did the condemning?
Yeah. Okay, I just John, asked John Fiedler sorry. to unmute. Sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I could not unmute myself there, so I was trying to uh, signal as best I could. Um, the the chimney was inspected by Yield Chimney Sweep um, a, a few years ago, and it was condemned due to structural issues and also uh, prior owners of the house had uh, tried to fix the some mortar issues, but they had apparently used bathroom caulk to do so and then the fires in it. Um, I, I don't know a whole lot about uh, masonry, but using bathroom caulk and fire, that's really not a good thing. And he said the chemical reactions um, that, that caused uh, put spider webbing of plastic up in the chimney um, as well as there are chemical reactions that are, are apparently very not good for brick um, that that caused. Uh, but there were also structural issues uh, that he saw in it. Um, unfortunately, since the time of the inspection, as I understand it, um, the owner of the old chimney suite passed away and the, the company has, um, I, I'm not sure if it exists. I've tried to get a hold of them to see if I could get a copy of the report and have not been successful. Um, I've, I've called on left messages and, and not been able to get actually get a hold of them. Thank you. Um, Daniel, do you have any questions? No, no questions. Sam? No questions. Allison? No questions, thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, let's move on to comments. Myth. Oh, I'm so Thank you again. <laughs> Duncan, do you have any comments or questions? Is, is this chimney used as a flue for a heating unit or anything else? Uh, no, it is no longer used for that. Um, the uh, gas furnaces are vented through uh, sidewalls. They are high efficiency gas furnaces. None of the flues are in use currently. Okay. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, Ernesto, do you have any questions? No comments, thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, did Chris, did you join us? I'm, I'm here. All right, Chris, do you have any questions? I just wonder if there's a fireplace. There, there's actually two fireplaces, which are smack dab in the center of the living room. Um, and the structural issues in the, the chimney were found on both of the flues for both fireplaces. So are you going to discontinue the fireplaces or gas them or uh, what, what, are, what are you doing? The, no, we've never been able to use the fireplaces. Uh, we had it inspected and they said, do not use these because it, the, the yield chimney sweep said very specifically, do not use these. And we had to sign a paper saying we wouldn't, so he would not be liable. Right. Yeah, you'd have to line the chimney and you could you could do that, but... I'm just there's giving you that information. Leg. Yeah, there's a dog leg in the flues for the fireplaces, so he said you could not actually drop a lining down. Oh, really? Yes, it's a it's a very interesting design. So that, to <laughs> okay, that's outside of our jurisdiction. That. I'm just thinking ahead for the a, a future owner that might want to use the fireplaces or something. Okay. No, that's all I got. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we'll move on to comments. Matthew. Well, I, I guess since it sounds like it's a, a semi-dangerous uh, chimney that uh, poses at least a public threat to the occupants of the house uh, and potentially to someone outside, I suppose, if it came down and the uh, district isn't perturbed, uh, I'm not perturbed. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Daniel? Um, yeah, I think the Elms Heights with their endorsement, I, I don't have any other comments. Great, thank you. Allison? Thank you. I'll be making a vote tonight and it will be uh, to approve this certificate of appropriateness based on what my colleagues already said. Great, thank you. And uh, Sam? I have no comments. 
Okay, and I'm in agreement with my colleagues here. Um, so we need a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. God, apologize. Duncan, any comments? No. Ernesto, any comments? No comments tonight, thank you. And Chris, any comments? Yes, the condition really means that you, you need to repair it. So we always get talk about condition, but I am understanding the neighborhood is not concerned and I, I'm not concerned then. Thank you, Chris. Now we need a motion. So moved. Second. All right. Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Sam DeSaller. This is a move to approve, yes? Yeah, yes, move yes. to approve. Yes, then. Matthew Seddon. Yes. John Saunders. Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to COA 22-17, 520 South Hawthorne Street. And the petitioner's with us. Hi, if the petitioner is with us on Zo via Zoom, can you raise your hand, please? Okay, yes. All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you for your patience. Um, so Certificate of Appropriateness, COA 22-11, is, um, is calling for the solar, pa uh, solar panel installation at 320 South Hawthorne Street in the Elm Heights Historic District. Upon reviewing the application material, staff understands that solar panel installation is highly dependent and limited to sun movement, even if that means they will be visible from the main rights of way, in this case, Hawthorne Drive and Second Street. So that, um, taking that into consideration, um, and the Elm Heights Construction Subcommittee that recommends the approval with recommendations. So the committee supports the installation of solar panels for this house, however, there were some concerns in the placement and number of panels. The house is rated very high in its contribution by location, as in Hawthorne, Hawthorne Street and its merit. It is also close to the top of the hill, and this should make the panels less obvious, but a tidy, tight, dark hue installation is vital. We recommend a better rendering of the panels Panel locations before approval, also the location of extra mechanical and wiring should be reviewed. We didn't see any pictures of what they would look like and they probably will be visible from Hawthorne. Um, I did um, ask about a potential battery installation, but it's just going to be the panels um, um, as staff. So let me see, this is another image of the house as it is at the moment. And these are the proposed locations for the solar panels. Um, so Second Street, it's south facing towards Second Street, which means that that's um, the street view also is co um, coincides with the better sun reach. Um, so, yes, um, yes. Give me one second. So, so with that, um, I finished my presentation. 
I leave it with you. However, the petitioner has their hand raised um, at you. the moment. All right. So I'm asking them to meet. Uh, petitioner, yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, thank you for taking the time here. Um, so yeah, that installation, we would, uh, we're gonna try to use the nicest black panels, uh, which are the LG line, use black railing, and uh, there would be no mechanical that would be seen. Everything would be integrated into the attic and then down through a chase in the house. And just everything we would do would just try to be as tidy and, and um, you know, clean as we could possibly make it. Uh, being Harmony students and being in the neighborhood, you know, we drive by it every single day. So we, we really would try to uh, just make sure to, to give the care to the structure that it deserves. And then I would just say that uh, like a K gutter or um, a asphalt roof, when the life of the product's over um, and it's removed, you will never, you'll never know that it was ever there. All right, thank you. Let's uh, move on to questions. Um, Matthew? No question. Sam? Uh, could the petitioner speak to the overall height of the assembly above the surface of the roof, including the racks? I know that the uh, panels are 40 millimeters thick, which is about an inch and a half, but how far up off the roof are these guys gonna sit? Um, ab about four inches. We, can, we have about an inch and a half of variability. Um, obviously, the higher they are off the roof, the better the production is, just because heat is the enemy of the solar panel. Uh, but they, you know they're going to be very low profile and going to be essentially um, uh, lining the roof in, in its in its profile. So, yeah, four inches, may, maybe three, depending, um, but not not like a foot off the roof or anything of that nature. Uh, could you explain the uh, heat is the enemy of the solar panel? question because if yeah, the, pan if yes, the so, wait 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 let me finish so, my question uh -huh. if, if the panels are above the roof and you know shading the roof the only heat is going to be on the surfaces adjacent to the roof right yeah yes without getting too technical the um the heat heat brings down the production because it increases resistance so you know sometimes you just see panels that are like literally like laying on the roof and it just traps a lot more heat. So if we get some wind that can move under the panel, that, that's better. Uh, but generally, we like to keep them as low as possible, also because we don't want any more wind load than, you know, than, than what the minimum is going to be. So in that sense, they're going to be pretty tight to the roof. Thank you. Allison? Yes, uh, one question. Has the historic uh, preservation body of that neighborhood made any remarks? The Elm Heights the, oh, folks? The, oh, go on. Uh, is that for me to answer or for somebody else? Sorry, these are different than at a uh, council table that I'm used to every day. Um, did you get the question? Yeah. Um, and I think so, it's for staff. Thank you. Yeah, no. Thank you. Um, the Elm Heights Construction Subcommittee, um, they recommended approval. However, they had recommendations which are listed. Um, so they, they wanted to have a bit more information on the dimensions of the panels and the sort of the infrastructure, the wiring and everything. Is, was that, does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay. Uh, Daniel? No questions. And actually, Allison asked my question what the neighborhood was asking about the report. Um, thank you. Uh, Duncan? I don't have any questions. Ernesto? Yes, this is a question for the petitioner. Uh, do you have a, a preferred location for the panels attached to the wall and exterior? A preferred location? Um, yeah. yeah. South South is always preferred. Um, in this case, the way that the roof line and the amount of energy that that the Applegates use, um, we would we would always go south first, 
West would be second. Mm -hmm. East is going to be third. Um, but in, and in this case, the only thing in a lot of ways, the East is going to look the cleanest because it has the most contiguous amount of real estate. So in that sense of things, um, again, South is, is what we would be looking for, for first. Um, but in this case, with the Applegates and the removal of their tree that was problematic on their house, um, any, any of those are all going to give a good harvest. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they use a lot of power, and I think they're going to get an electric car. And so they will um, only, I'm sure, use more power in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris? Yeah, the, the computer rendering is what's a little concerning because it has the panels sticking over the edge of the roof and over the ridges. And I'm sure that's not really accurate that's just how you can what you can do on the computer but i would ask staff is that why you might want to review the installation if, if it's approved so that it's doesn't look like this re rendering yeah um oh, yeah sorry um i think we can address that in the motion and, and can i put can i put one comment and is, is just that uh, the National Electric Code and the um, Indiana Residential Code, neither one of those allow for panels to be hanging over in any part of an eave or, uh, or over the hip. So in that sense, if, if that ever happens, that's really a flagrant building code violation, just, just so the council kind of knows. Right, but you see the drawing that we're referring to where it shows them doing that. Yeah, and, and what, what the problem is, is if it's a lot of like a mid-century house where it would just be a very rectangle line, it, it's real easy in paint to kind of make it a look like a represent, uh, representational. Whereas in something like that, the problem that we have is just, um, yeah, when you're trying to make boxes on a two-dimensional, it just it doesn't turn out the way that it's, it's, it's just, yeah, I, 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 I thought. It, yeah, it's not representative. <laughs> Right, and wouldn't you agree that the east facing is the most visible from the street and the road? Yes, sir. That's where that's where if you're at Second and uh, Hawthorne, you would you would see it the most. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you're you, welcome. Chris. All right. Um, let's move on to comments. Um, Sam. Uh, first, let me say that I'm a big proponent of solar, and uh, I appreciate that the uh, petitioner is installing this now before net metering sunsets on June 30th. Um, yes. That said, uh, I, I would love to approve this with the caveats that it gets installed such that no panels overhang the ridges, which is slightly different from what you and Chris were talking about. So it's all got to be um, contained within the plane of the roof on which it sits. And you know, I'm sure you're going to do that, but I just want to stipulate that so there's no confusion. And then the other thing that I would love to see happen is minimizing the height and keeping it, say, you know, give yourself two and a half inches or something underneath for air ventilation so that they're tight to the roof as possible, but it's still, uh, you get some vents under there. Um, Second Street, which is along the east, is I actually think the, the highest visibility. It's the most traffic street. My daughter goes to Harmony, so I uh, go by your house a lot, and I love your house. It's pretty fantastic. I really hope someday somebody opens up that second floor porch on Second Street, because it's, it's, yeah, it's a fantastic house. Um, but I'm going to uh, support this installation. Thank you, Sam. Daniel? Um, I have no comments. Same here, I have no comments and in uh, an agreement of the solar uh, energy. I think it's a great thing these folks are doing. Um, Duncan, do you have any comments? No. Ernesto? No comments, thanks. Chris? Yeah, I noticed a neighbor who had solar panels, and I'm not sure they ever got approved, but I'm not looking there anymore. Um, 
Yeah, sometimes I like to think that people might not want to put them on the highest visibility point, but I understand that ultimately everything is temporary. All right, thank you, Chris. So uh, we need a motion. I'll move to approve uh, with the caveat that the panels be installed uh, without overhanging the eaves or ridges. All right, second. I'll second. Thank you. Dave? <clears throat> Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSaller? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yep. John Saunders? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. All thank right, you. Let's, let's move on to uh, COA 22-18. And we have the petitioner with us on this one. Let me, give me one second. No problem. If the petitioner for 1000 East Atwater Avenue is present, can you please raise your hand via Zoom? I believe they might be here, but it's hard for me to navigate um, Zoom participant names. Did you say they're there? Okay. Gloria, do you see I have a I have a raised hand. Okay, excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay, so for certificate of appropriateness 22-18 for 1000 East Atwater Avenue, located in the Elm Heights Historic District, the petitioner John Beerman is requesting for full window replacement. Um, so staff looked at the at the guidelines for the Elm Heights Historic District and at the comments from their neighborhood construction subcommittee and um, does not recommend approval for 22-18. That said, um, historic, the issue with historic windows is that um, once you replace them, they, you know, they're, they're gone. Um, and even though the, I'm going to show you the replacement um, options, where, which are in form and style, pretty similar in the general geometry. But um, staff does encourage the owners to restore them and to replace the storm windows that they used to have. Um, and look at technologies that um, are more current, but you know, working on restoring the windows instead. They do need uh, love and care. And if the last thing that staff wants to comment is that if replacement is absolutely necessary, a conditions like a very detailed condition survey of each individual and in window would be required. Um, and. In that case, staff would also recommend site visits from commissioners. And with that said, um, here, here is the Elm Heights Construction Subcommittee comments. I am going to leave them up for um, about a minute because this is pretty, yeah, there's a lot here. <clears throat> So they have no problems with the windows on the addition to the rear of the house being repaired, replaced, sorry, replaced. However, the windows on the original structure are integral to the style and the story of the house. Um, the numerous lights and wood mountain styles and rails give the house its character. So yeah, with that, I'm going to um, leave it to the commissioners. Thank you, Gloria. So. Um, Let's move to questions, and let's start with um, Daniel. I don't have any questions at this time. Sam, do you have any questions? I guess my only question is, uh, I see a bunch of different windows, but I don't see which windows belong to which openings, so it's difficult for the commission 
to determine if you're maintaining the uh, operation and size and number of lights and all that stuff. Uh, so could the petitioner talk to that? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, the plan would be to keep all window openings the same size uh, dimensions, everything as uh, close to original as possible. Functionality Sorry, so, as well. So the, yeah, the fun, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, so, Matthew? Um, I'm just looking at the guidelines again, and it says if original windows, doors, and hardware can be restored and reused, they should not be replaced. So, can you elaborate on why they can't be restored or reused? Sure, they have been restored uh, multiple times over the past few years, and we are looking for uh, uh, something just a little more durable. Um, and the condition that they're in and that they're deteriorating over the time because of all the wear and tear they've had. So the objective is to just get something in there that will look historically accurate, but last a lot longer. I have no questions. Allison? Yes. <clears throat> I, I kind of forgot my question. It's been a long day, so give me a second. Oh, my goodness. I had a deer today, so uh, a, a buck, so let's see. My question was regarding, oh, the cost. Um, I assume that there's a cost difference between restoration and replacement. Could someone address that, please? That is a fantastic question, and I honestly don't have an answer for that. Um, the restoration, uh, as far as a full restoration, I, I would have to dig into that. Have not even. I, I know we spend several thousand each year just maintaining and um, fixing any any time the pain breaks or anything to that respect. A follow-up, is that appropriate? Um, how, do you have a quote for these windows here? For the new replacement a windows? New, a new, new windows, yeah. Uh, yes, and I want to say it was in the range of 20, 25,000, give or take. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Duncan? I have any questions? Yes. No questions. Uh, Ernesto, questions? Yes, I have a question for the petitioner. <clears throat> if you were to replace those windows, what type of windows were quoted? Are these comparable to the existing windows in terms of wood? Uh, cladding, aluminum, what are we talking about here? We have, actually, we have two different options. The one that I sent in is a uh, vinyl wrapped wood window that would give the similar appearance to what's in there. Um, I also have a quote for wood windows that uh, would also look um, the same. The, uh, the end result is there was uh, about a five thousand, six thousand dollar difference between them, with the with the ones that I'm presenting being on the cheaper end, um, but the appearance was I couldn't tell much of a difference. Follow up. Um, one more question: uh, yeah. Did you have a, an assessment of the condition of the windows by a professional or? Uh, you know, somebody who, re you know, repairs historic windows? Tom, Tommy Dees and uh, Brawley Property Group um, both have looked at them and have recommended replacement. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, so let's move on to comments. And let's start. Wait, I have, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. 
That's okay. I thought I read that those uh, had muttons in between the glass, one of the proposed replacements. Is that right? I'm possibly, I don't know. Uh huh. That's correct, Chris. Okay. And I would just answer that repairing them costs less than new ones. Yes. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, let's move on to comments. Ah, yeah. Uh, the, well, what I see is that uh, original windows uh, can be restored and reused as they have been before, and that probably adding uh, the storms, uh, appropriate storms would, would cut down on the frequency of, uh, of repairs. And so, and the uh, uh, district is, is not in favor of this. So I'm, at the moment, I'm not in favor of this either. Thank you, Matthew. Daniel. There we are. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo what, what Matthew had said. I, I agree with both recommendations being against it. Um, I think that speaks pretty loudly. Thank you. And um, um, Sam? Uh, I think the guidelines for Elm Heights are very clear that uh, you need to repair windows before you replace them. That said, there are a couple of windows on here uh, that the neighborhood did point out that are not original windows, which I feel could be replaced. Uh, however, if you're replacing a window, I don't think it applies to the windows that you actually can replace. Well, that, I think this commission would uh, approve replacing. Uh, the uh, muttons inside the glass don't fly you're gonna to have to get as historically accurate as possible. You want applied muttons on both sides of glass with a shadow bar in between. It's good that you're using wood windows, so we appreciate that. Um, but you're gonna to have to spell out what windows you're going to replace, what the replacements are. And if you wanna make a case for replacing any original windows, you're gonna to have to document uh, those windows extensively before we'd even consider replacement. Um, okay. So I, I, I cannot uh, uh, approve this one as it stands, but there are, I believe, a couple of windows, especially on the rear of the house, that if you wanna come back, we would uh, consider. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Allison? Yeah, I'm actually inclined to approve this um, it does appear that the petitioner has multiple times tried to repair these, and it's costing them, you know, thousands of dollars each year. Um, not to mention that the uh, the photographs of the windows look almost identical. It sounds like the material is going to be appropriate. So, I mean, I think that it sounds like this petitioner is kind of kind of exhausted from. <laughs> Um, from repairing these windows year after year. Um, you know, we just looked at another project that improved um, the efficiency of a home, and I would assume that uh, new windows would create that effect as well. So I will be voting yes tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Duncan, comments? Well, the, the normal standard is to is to have a window survey to, to document the condition. And uh, secretary standards call for 60% of the window being uh, unrepairable. Uh, that's the that's the general standard. And would single pane windows with a uh, a decent storm window are more efficient than new windows as presented? Thank you, Duncan. Uh, Ernesto, comments? Yes, uh, I agree with uh, the staff recommendation. That's all. Thank you, and Chris, comments? Chris? You're muted.
Okay, uh, I'm gonna agree with uh, my commissioners here about these windows. Um, preferably, I'd like to see them uh, restored and like to see um, uh, storms put in. Uh, probably a lot more efficient than the newer windows. That's my comments. Did Chris come back? Okay. Oh, I commented, but I was muted. <laughs> Let's see. Did, did anyone, no one heard my comment, I guess. I said the windows are approaching 100 years old and they need to be maintained and they've been maintained over the years and here's a, an owner that doesn't want to continue that uh, maintenance of these windows, which could last, if you maintain them, another 100 years. So uh, the replacement windows won't last that long. So I support staff. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I need a motion. I'll move to deny. Second. D. Okay, Daniel Schlegel. I just want to, if I say yes, I'm agreeing with the motion. Okay, I just wanted to be clear, yes. Okay. Sam DeSaller. Yes. Matthew Sutton? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Allison Chopra? No. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, COA 22-19. Is the petitioner with us? Can the petitioner please raise their hand via Zoom? Okay, excellent, thank you. They are here. Um, so this um, project, COA 22-22, sorry, 22-19 um, for an addition at 208 East 16th Street in the Garden Hill Historic District. Um, different iterations of the project have already come before the commission in, last year. Um, Lisa Freeman, the owner, has been working with the Neighborhood uh, Building Construction Subcommittee since then, and they've gone through various revisions and versions until the community and the owner found a solution that worked for both of them. The Application, sorry, the new proposal does change the facade in um, vastly. This is how it looks right now. Uh, some commissioners actually visited this site last year at one point, and uh, the building is a bit of a hodgepodge inside and out. Um, it's been through some, it's, it's had some personal history of change. Um, it's located very much to the back of the lot, which makes it very difficult for expansion towards the back, impossible actually, so it can only expand towards the front and upwards. Um, that said, the owner and, the, and, and their designer worked on creating a facade that would be very different from the current facade, but would be in keeping with the guidelines for the neighborhood. Um, historic district and the neighborhood construction subcommittee um, approved of this of these changes. So here is their quote: "The neighbor, the Garden Hill Neighborhood Association has reviewed this application for ACOA. We are pleased to recommend the project for approval. We believe the new home will have a will be a significant asset to the community here. Thank you kindly for your consideration. And uh, yeah." <laughs> Staff recommends approval for COA 22-19. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, let's do uh, questions. Uh, we'll start with Allison. I have no questions, thank you. Okay. Daniel? No questions. Sam? No questions. Matthew? No questions. Yeah, I have no questions regarding this. Duncan? And I had a little 
difficulty reading the plan. Is it is there a second story being added as well? A half story, a half story dormer. A half story dormer. Is that over the whole house? No, just the front. Okay. To the front okay. portion. I understand it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ernesto? Any questions, Ernesto? Sorry, I, I thought I said no questions, sorry. Thank you. Chris, no questions? Questions. questions. Um, I had a question about parking, but it looked like when I drove by and it looks like on the plan that there are two parkings off that alley. Is that garage part of the parking? So the, um, the existing garage will remain and then we're just adding the two gravel spots as you see there in front of the garage. So there's adding that retainer wall and just extending that gravel. Right, what, what height is that retaining wall? Uh, approximately 40 inches. Oh, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. And then the, the rest of the parking will be on street in front of the exactly. mm -hmm. place. Exactly, okay. parking, which is permitted. Right. right, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you, Chris. Let's uh, move on to comments. Uh, let's start with Allison. I have no comments, thank you. Daniel? Um, no, no comments. Sam? I think this is a great improvement over the last iteration that uh, we saw and uh, provided that the uh, plans, well, actually, the, the fenestration is per the elevations and not the plans, and uh, that staff has the opportunity to review anything that changes the exterior because of uh, the uh, permitting process. Uh, I strongly stand behind this one. Thank you. And uh, I have no comments. I think it's a good project. Um, Duncan, comments? Yeah, I, I mean, normally when I see uh, an addition alter the original uh, intention of the design so drastically, I, I'm kind of automatically against it. But um, I, I can see, I know that they've worked hard on it. As Sam said, this is a, a very big improvement. Um, over the previous one. And um, I'm not sure what else one could do here. It's, a, it's very, very difficult to, to, to put these kinds of additions on this structure. And as um, staff pointed out, the structure has been pretty well muddled over time. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we're looking at anything like its original configuration. So mm -hmm. uh, I would support this. Thank you, uh, Duncan. Ernesto. Yes, uh, I agree with Duncan. I, I don't think there is much left of the original uh, house. So it's a major improvement to what is being shown tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little sorry about the vinyl siding. I, I'd like, I think cement board siding would be a better fit, but I think they've, what's really interesting is they've illustrated through this process, the, the reforms that we've been discussing with uh, having the petitioner meet with the neighborhood up front and, and sparing all the pain of coming to two meet different petitions that had to be rejected because of a failure to really work through the process with the neighborhood and the guidelines. And what's coming out of this is a much better process, much better project with a, with a poor prod process. And I think it illustrates the, the need for our process reform. And I'm still sorry about vinyl, but that's just me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, I need a motion. I move to approve. Second. Right. Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Sam DeSoller. Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Motion carried. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Great, thank you. You're welcome. 
Uh, let's move on to COA 22-20, 916 South Morton Street, and I see the petitioner is present. Thank you. All right, Gloria. Excellent. So, give me one second. I need to. Okay, so the petitioner, sorry, it's like, oh, wrong picture. Sorry, wrong picture for the house. Envision a bungalow in McDowell Gardens instead of um, a ranch in Garden Hill. And uh, sorry. So, um, the petitioner, I'm just gonna skip to the plans. Um, the petitioner and the owners are requesting for an addition to the, um, the house, and this house in McDowell Gardens. This is part of a long-term chain of projects that started with a, a garage and then with working the front facade and now the final phase I believe this is the final phase, you can correct me, um, is the addition of, um, of a room to the side. Um, as staff, I originally had some concerns regarding the shape and the geometry of the building. However, um, meeting with the petitioner and the owners and seeing just how far back this addition would be, um, and the fact that the McDowell Gardens Neighborhood Association supports this project and that the house is actually absolutely tiny. I've, I actually went and did a site visit and um, half the house is basically the bedroom right now. So um, the, the addition is actually barely visible from the street because this house is on a hill. Um, this area of Morton Street, the houses are I would say about between eight and 10 feet above the ground. Um, so it's quite leveled up and then it's very, um, it's towards the back and the architecture for the, the new area, the design and the exterior are compatible with the house. And having taken all of this into careful consideration, although as staff, and I did um, as staff, ask for a change in material. And so I'm seeing that there is a bit of a sort of something that separates them with the paneling between the two parts. Um, this has been done with a lot of care. Uh, here's the Neighborhood Association comments. The McDowell Executive Committee is in transition at the moment, but we have a quorum in support for the proposed addition to the Pools Bungalow next to Cardinal Spirits at South Morton. We have complete faith in Barry Clapper. We love her work. So, <laughs> So that said, um, staff does recommend approval for COA 22-19. Please disregard Lisa Friedman's house on this image. Thank you, Gloria. Um, let's go to questions. Um, Daniel, do you have questions? Uh, no, nothing at this time. All right, thank you. Sam? Are you gonna make this red to match the house next door? Are you gonna paint it red to match the house next door? Good, thank you. Matthew? No questions. Uh, Allison? No questions, thank you. And I don't have any questions at this point. Have I got everybody? Yes, all right, Duncan, questions? Uh, the, the front porch is being extended, is that right? As part of the same project? Correct. And can you tell me how much farther it's coming out? Four feet for about two-thirds of the width. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Duncan. Ernesto? Yes. Uh, I just have a question regarding the, the garage. Uh, what was the determination for the height of the garage? I see that it's a little bit taller than the actual main structure. I'm happy to answer. That's already, already, it's already been approved. I understand, I'm just curious. It is about, I think it was about five feet taller than the ridge of the original house. It, there is a storage space above the garage. And it is slightly elevated. Large. It's slightly elevated so that it can match the floor elevation of the original house. So the owners can age in place. They can drive into the garage and then exit from their vehicles and go straight into the house. 
Thanks, Steve. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I missed the explanation of the change in the transition material. What, what was that comment? Uh, yes. Front elevation, I guess. Yeah, so um, I had, uh, when we met, we met um, just before Barry submitted, um, and uh, uh, as staff might, I don't know, I, I wanted the sort of the addition to to be a little bit more separate from the house or to feel like it's it wasn't um, overpowering or overwhelming or eating at the geometry of the, I wanted the bungalow to read as a, as a standalone, you know, for bungalow and not as, you know, um, not as a horizontal large house. And so there's many things to, to be taken into account. It's actually farther back than it looks in ele elevation tricks the eye. And um, there's this subtle change um, in the connector area. There is a change in the cladding that just allows it to read a little differently. So th sometimes those subtle details help. That, that was my point of view on it. I hope that clarifies what I was trying to say. Yeah, I just missed. I didn't understand, but I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, we'll do comments. Um, Daniel? Comments? Uh, no, no comments at this time. Uh, Sam? It's, it's been fun to watch the accretional growth of this structure at an exponential rate. It's like watching it, you know, one of those uh, fast motion films. But um, I think the petitioner has done a nice job articulating the new versus the old and uh, letting the main house still maintain uh, its, uh, I guess, primacy over both the garage and the, uh, uh, the addition. And it's almost becoming a, a small compound at this point. Uh, so I, I really, uh, this one's fun. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Matthew. No comments. Allison. No comment, thank you. Um, my only comment is I think it's a great project and appreciate all the work that's been done to make this what it is. Um, Duncan, do you have any comments? Uh, no. Ernesto, comments? Yes, yeah, just want to say I think it looks great. I, I love the idea of the separation of their primary bedroom with the rest of the house and allowing them to age in place. I think that's, that's really great. I'm really looking forward to see this um, completion. Thank you. Thank you. And Chris? Yeah, it's another good example of interaction of an owner and, a, and an architect and a historic designation that brings about a, a much better project. So everybody wins. Thank you. Thank you. We need a motion. I'll move to approve COA 20, uh, what is it, 22 20. Second. Great. D. Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Sam DeSoller. Yes. Matthew Seddon. Yep. John Saunders. Yes. Allison Chopra. Yes. Motion carries. Great. Okay. Uh, new business. Let me unmute myself. So I included um, as staff uh, in the packet a memorandum of agreement for the um, an INDOT project at 10th Street and, and Pete Ellis Drive that affect, uh, impacts the Hinkelgarten Farmstead. Um, Sorry, and I just, I'm bringing this more for your information and to update everybody because uh, the Historic Preservation Commission should have been part of this memorandum of agreement. However, this occurred, all the, uh, the information was sent out and the petition for our information was sent out between the time Connor left and I arrived, so there was, um, sort of a void in staff. That said, um, I'm getting looped in with the 
with the goings on and the interagency and departmental meetings that are happening. This project has been pushed back a bit in its timeline. There's still some things and decisions that are in development. Um, I believe Steve White is here. Um, BRI was included in a memorandum of agreement pursuant to section 106 um, and everything that involves, I'm trying to remember the CFR, but I'm not, it's not coming up at the moment. That said, um, they have been in contact with um, BRI and are doing a lot of um, mitigation to avoid impacting the site, the Hinkle Farms, Garden Farmstead. In the end, there's going to be a path that runs by the road. Um, it's going to be either um, either a multi-use or um, a sidewalk. So th there's, there's going to be a path there. There's a lot of stuff still going on. Um, it's going well. At some point, it will come to us as a CO, C of A. That's still a little bit in the future, but I did want to inform all of you. And by, by law, um, we are a certified local government, and your voice is important and legally prescribed in this type of case. So um, yeah, just letting you know what's going on with this project. It's all looking good so far. I believe he is. I... Steve, are you with us? Yes. Do you have uh, any additional comments or, or to address? Uh, just that I hope that, uh, I mean, we've worked pretty closely with uh, the state and their uh, consultants to uh, come up with a, a design that, that minimizes the impact on the farmstead. And I hope if there are changes to it, uh, that they don't uh, cause problems. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so far, so good. All right, thank you, Steve. So we move on to uh, old business? Yes. And that would be the Johnson Creamery nomination. Yes. Um, can the um, owners and representatives of the Johnson Creamery and the Smokestack raise your hands via Zoom so that I can um, include you in the conversation? Please? OK, give me one second. Excellent. Let me see if there's anybody else. Okay. So I have um, included in the packets a staff report for the Johnson Creamery. Um, it is a bit extensive. Did I echo? Okay. It is a bit extensive, therefore I'm not going to read the entirety entirety of it here. However, um, upon doing historical research and review, staff has found that the creamery exemplifies the cultural, political, economic, social, I would say, and historic heritage of the community, um, not just through by the creamery being one of Bloomington's top um, industrial centers at one point number four, only after uh, stonemasonry, the stonemasonry furniture and, inst and university, um, well, you could call it academic industry. So it, at one point it, they hired up to 100 people, but they also fed most of Bloomington. So you can see the whole history. <laughs> Through the history of the creamery, you can see the history of Bloomington's um, foodways from farm to table, local industry. So a lot of um, the products, whether it was milk, whether it was fruits, whether it was water, were all locally sourced. And therefore, um, this helped the farmers and was really part of um, Bloomington's economy in that regard. But this, the creamery also supplied the area with many of its dairy products um, for 75 years. And for a long time, it also represented the whole history of the creamery and like industry in the United States. It's a little bit of a microcosm having 
um, delivery, home delivery up until the 50s or 60s. Um, they used horse cart, horse drawn carts until 1939. So they started phasing out in 1938, but they continued using motorized vehicles for a time. And just like that rest of that industrial history and food production history, the creamery also ended up closing when uh, milk and other products were being sort of consolidated into these you know, multi-state industries and large supermarket chains. And like other um, industrial structures, the creamery was eventually rehabilitated, just like the building we are in right now, to a space that offers um, office space and other similar types of services. Um, as staff, I also looked at the architectural components um, at um, owing to its unique location or physical characteristics represents an established and familiar visual feature of the city. We will talk about the smokestack <laughs> in a minute. Put a pin on that. But that said, it is currently one of Bloomington's most um, large, uh, tallest, but also most um, iconic structures, both the factory, the former factory, and the smokestack. The, the factory itself, the historic creamery, has a very interesting and different layout from many other buildings because it also traces, as all these technologies and dairy production were changing, the building itself traces the history of, thing, of technology as things had to be changed. So when people changed ice boxes to refrigerators, you didn't need a giant, giant ice um, container that would hold all the ice they were going to sell that year in one single place. Um, and so you see that the building does have a bit of a Frankenstein aspect to it or a assemblage aspect to it, but that is because the building on the exterior and the interior reflects all of these changes over time. It also um, reflects the geometry of having the railroad tracks right by it, so it's got that, it's not a rectangular site at all. Um, and the smokestack, which has the word Johnson on it, is also a very important aspect of, of this conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically I, uh, in my description right now, I also incorporated G, exemplifies the built environment in an era of history characterized by a distinctive architectural style. So basically, the, it shows the growth and the changes that came in through the 20th century industrial um, architecture. And uh, yeah, so the packet has much more information. I tried to summarize it as much as I could. So here are some images um, courtesy of the Monroe County History Center, citing sources. Um, this photograph is, is, although undated, is probably from some point before 1939. As you can still see the horse-drawn um, carts, and in the background you can see the original smokestack, which was considerably taller than the current one. Um, here are some more images. I'm going to go back to the map because that's something that also needs to be talked about. So this is the, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of. So this is the southern facade, it, the main facade. And the northern facade, where you can see the Art Deco um, three-story structure that used to house ice, I believe, and the uh, different views of the smokestack. And uh, one of the very important components of um, drawing maps and and determining what parts are going to be prioritized for protection. Um, so this map was drawn in order to take into consideration um, the existing components of the building. However, um, part of the part of the small structure 
There's some things that still need a little tweaking, and um, I believe Peerless, you um, contacted the city with some questions about this. So this is a good time to talk about um, the boundaries and where they should be set. And uh, that's pretty much my presentation where it's at at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gloria. So we're gonna hear from Peerless now. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Michael Cordero. I'm the founder and owner of Peerless Development. Um, thanks everybody for your time today. Um, we, you know, our our purpose for coming today, as we thought, but you know, didn't really uh, get put on the agenda was really to discuss the um, the smokestack, the condition of the smokestack, and uh, hands repair order um, that was issued to us um, a couple of months ago. Um, that uh, since that time, we did uh, hire RC engineers to uh, do a new structural report on the uh, condition of the smokestack and give recommendation um, on what should be done. Uh, so we do want to sort of touch on that today and hopefully we, we can, um, you know, try to come to some resolution there. Um, and really, you know, what we would be um, seeking would be uh, a partial demolition uh, according to RC's um, recommendation down to 60 feet and then restoring and repairing uh, the rest of the smoke stack. And I think, you know, what, and and with that would also come the demolition of the, the little shed, which was really added on as an equipment room for AT&T's cellular equipment. Um, so part of the demolition would be that. And I think that sort of answers one of the questions that Gloria brought up regarding the boundary of the um, potential historical uh, designation. Um, the other part we would like to talk about is that boundary. Um, we would, you know, I guess going back, you know, if we, if we were given certificate of appropriateness for the demolition down to 60 feet, I think Peerless as the owners of this building um, would be happy to comply and go along with um, an HPC recommendation to um, mark this, you know, the office building and the, you know, the rest of the stack as a, a local designated um, property. Um, the other thing we would like to adjust is to have the boundaries of that um, more closely follow the foundation of the building so that we know we're, um, we're developing on the north parking lot, uh, an apartment building, uh, and there will have a shared easement driveway um, between the two properties. So we we want to be able to do repairs. We're going to be tearing up and re-pouring the foundation and the, and the um, sort of parking spots that you can see in that image right there. Um, we didn't know if that if like ground repair, um, driveway repair. We don't know, I guess, maybe we can ask right now if that falls under the, the purview of the HPC and if we would have to come back, um, you know, every time we need to do landscaping or, uh, or repairs to the parking lot or sidewalks, um, we'd like to get that question answered. So at the very least, we'd like to exclude the potential easement area, um, but really we'd like it to probably exclude the entire parking lot. Thank you. Um, uh, so we're going to do commissioner comments now. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's move to commissioner comments on this because we're going to move this to city council and we'll make that decision this evening to forward it on. Okay, great. Thank you, Gloria. Um, Wait, um, legal has a comment. Yes. Sorry, just, uh, just kind of a, I guess a procedural point. Um, there are a couple of things. One, uh, tonight is the opportunity for public comment on the question of designation, so we need to have an opportunity for that. Um, and, and certainly also then the, the standard question and comment period. But I just wanted to interject that we do need a public comment portion of this as well. Okay. 
So let's do public comment now. And um, Gloria, you have the Zoom. Uh, do we have uh, comments from the public at this point? Um, I'm going to ask the, hold up. So the people who have their hands raised, um, can you lower them? And if you have a, unless you have a comment right now, as part of the public? Okay, so yes, there is a, com there is, um, a person who wants to speak, Karen Duffy. Thank you, Karen. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'm here as a um, member of the executive board for the Near West Side Neighborhood Association. I have a letter from the executive board, the, which consists of um, seven people, the officers and three representatives at large. I'm one of the representatives at large, but our president, Peter Dorfman, couldn't attend. So I'm reading it for him and for the whole board. Uh, dear commissioners, the executive board of the Near West Side Neighborhood Association fully supports the nomination of Johnson's Creamery as an historic district. With our border located just a block west of the property, our neighborhood enjoys special historic ties with the creamery. Many of our houses were home to creamery workers. Preparing the nomination for our own recently designated conservation district has raised our awareness of these ties and likewise heightened our awareness of the creamery's larger significance as an early industry in the city of Bloomington. Furthermore, like many others in Bloomington today, we recognize the Creamery building with its iconic smokestack as a landmark of our community. Its unique architectural character is one we value and want to see protected by historic district status for Bloomingtonians of the future to enjoy. Finally, we deeply appreciate the efforts of the commission and staff to move this nomination forward. Sincerely, the Near West Side Neighborhood Association Executive Board. And I have the names and I can send this to you, Gloria, if you'd like it. Thank you. Yes, please do. Yes, please. There are two more people with their hands okay. raised. Um, I'm going to ask um, Peter to unmute. Thank you, Karen. Yes, hi, uh, Peter Dorfman. I did actually manage to make it to the meeting. Um, I want to reinforce uh, everything that, that Karen just said um, as one of the signatories of that letter. And I just wanted to add a personal note to that. I, I haven't been in Bloomington as long as Karen has or some of the other people on the board of, of the Near West Side Neighborhood Association, but um, I, I, I view the smokestack as uh, a, a true landmark representative of Bloomington. I, I, I believe that smokestack is to Bloomington what the arch is to St. Louis. And uh, I, I, on a personal basis, I haven't vetted this with the rest of the board of the association, but uh, I, I strongly oppose uh, the reduction of the height of that. I, I, I believe that, that there are practical ways to uh, shore up that smokestack at its current height. Uh, I would hate to see it reduced and uh, I'm, I'm opposed to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have one more person, um, Janice Orby. Oh, and yeah, and after that, Mike Cordaro. Um, Jan? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, this is Jan Sorby, and um, when I found out that this was going to be reviewed uh, tonight, I was kind of surprised because uh, there are a multitude of reasons, but there are very few industrial buildings left in Bloomington. Many, many of them have been raised. And um, there's nothing, absolutely nothing like this left at all. It makes it really an anomaly and very precious to most people in Bloomington. Um, it's our skyline. This is what we see. This is also acts as a wayfarer sign 
you know, you're in Bloomington, you look up and you can find where you are in relationship to this area. So it, it acts as more of uh, a defining character of Bloomington than many buildings around today. And um, just, I'd like to add my personal idea too. If you cut this down, it's gonna lose all of its beautiful elegance. It's gonna become short and stubby. And for these reasons, again, with the historic importance of this industrial building, I really uh, support the Neighborhood Association's point of view, and please do not let this be reduced. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And finally, we have uh, Mike Cordaro. Um, it, owner is, um, wants to speak. Um, I just want to say we'd be happy to sell it to the city of Bloomington for a dollar and please keep it up as a part of the a landmark skyline structure. Um, no private person owns the art in St. Louis. Um, so happy to, uh, happy to donate it to the city. Thank you. Uh, any more public comments? Um, and unless someone, does somebody in the hall want to speak? Yeah. Introduce yourself. Bob Council, uh, lifetime, lifelong Bloomingtonian and a member of the hand department here in Bloomington, but that's beside the point. Um, I agree with what everybody said as far as Bloomingtonians go. This is a landmark in our city. You drive into town, you see it. And as a kid, it's, you know, I grew up going to Fairview School, walking past it every day to go down to the public library. This is, it's, it's a big deal. And to have somebody who is not from Bloomington come in and chop it off with no care or no I don't even have a word for it. It's frustrating, and um, I, I think it's wrong to take a Bloomington icon and a Bloomington landmark and just chop it off to 60 feet. It's all I had. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. This is Daniel Dixon with the legal department. I did just want to, uh, I guess, make another procedural note. Uh, tonight, we are we are really just on the question of of whether or not the commission wants to make a recommendation to the city council that this map be approved. We're not deciding anything about, about the height. If that map is sent to city council and the city council adopts an ordinance placing this under protection, um, then a certificate of appropriateness would be the process by which that issue would be debated. Um, there, there were materials in the packet tonight, obviously just to provide some context to the structural integrity of that, but um, that is a, 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 just a, a, to distinguish that process from kind of the narrow issue for this body for this evening. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I still wanna move on to uh, commissioner comments about this. Um, so uh, Duncan. Uh, we're having comments. We are having comments. And this on is the, to move the project. On, this the, is on, on the nomination? Yes. Yeah, well, I, I, I favor the nomination. I, I favor making this a local historic district. Um, I'm a little concerned about the map of the boundary. And, I'm, I, and I know Gloria said that that's somewhat unresolved. Um, but I wanted to point out that uh, plans for an apartment building notwithstanding, the National Register nomination covers the entire parking lot all the way to 8th Street. And so the National Register property for the Johnson Creamery building uh, includes the parking lot. And, and the reason that it does that is that's where all of the cooling equipment was stationed in the original building. And that was the original, that's the original site plot. Um, now I know there are extenuating circumstances since we have a new owner who uh, is planning to fill that parking lot with another building. But um, my comment, I guess, is that I'm not sure what happens to the viability of the National Register nomination if you change the boundary. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know what exactly what the process is at the National Register to 
uh, how that would be, de be determined, whether they would, um, I guess there would have to be an amendment to the National Register nomination to change the boundary. Um, but that's, a, that's something we don't really have the answer to yet. Um, so I, I'm a little bit concerned about, I, I understand what the extenuating circumstances are and why the owner wants that boundary to be as close to the building as possible, but um, it, it, that somewhat complicates the nomination and, and we can't, we can't vote to move the, the, the nomination forward in a definitive way until we know exactly what the boundary is going to be because <laughs> we need to have a boundary. So I'm not, I'm not sure when we have that discussion, uh, Daniel Dixon, but it, it seems like that's, that's the outstanding issue here. It seems like there's, I mean, you should hear from the rest of the commissioners, but I think there will be general support for the nomination. Hi, Duncan, this is Daniel. Um, you know, that, that question could be answered tonight. There is, and I don't know if Gloria, if you can put that, that picture on the screen, um, certainly, a, a, you know, that line is there. If, if the commissioners wanted to, to adjust or do something else, there could be a motion to do that or redraw or something else. But that could be discussed tonight as well. Thank you, Daniel. Um, all right, let's move on to um, Ernesto, if you have comments, and we'll, then we'll get to yeah. the uh, property lines. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, I support the nomination. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, I support. I think Duncan could suggest an amendment that might be uh, appropriate and my comment is our job is to declare whether we think this is a historic property worthy of designation. That is our role, and I think it's clear that it is. Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, let's move on to uh, Allison. I just want to make sure that I understand. Tonight we're discussing whether or not we should forward this to the city council correct. so that they can determine that it's historic. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. We recommend it to city council and they will then make the decision to designate it as a historic site. Okay. And that is what we will be voting on today? Yeah, that would be our recommendation, yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh uh, Matthew, do you have any comments? Uh, well, and just to clarify, when we send it to the council, we send it with a boundary, or does the boundary or does the council make the determination? Uh, and from my understanding with Daniel is that we will send it with the boundary okay. that we will determine. All right. Well, then my comment is that I, I think the um, petitioner's request to have the boundary match the footprint of the building. Um, Plus, uh, I would say the, the smokestack, um, uh, maybe, not, maybe not the little shed. Uh, I think that's very reasonable. I understand what um, my um, esteemed colleague Duncan is saying about the National Register boundary extending into the parking lot and the reason for that being that there used to be stuff there. But as there is no stuff there uh, anymore, it doesn't bother me too much. And I don't think it would affect the National Register nomination. So if a if a federal action wanted to have an impact on that property, uh, it would be the, the National Register uh, designation, the, the boundary there. So we would simply be determining what could be done within the city. So I don't, I don't think it would you know, do much there. I mean, I, do, I can imagine that there won't be a federal action having to do with that parking lot, but um, I'm not concerned about it because there isn't anything there. I, I'm, I mean, I understand the worry, but it's a parking lot. So um, that's my only comment. I would say that we should put the boundary at the footprint of the, of the building. Thank you. Allison? I apologize. I do need to uh, ask one other question. I think this is for legal. Can the city council revise the boundary? I believe they have the authority to do that by a motion or amendment. So in, in that case, I would leave it as is um, and let the council uh, debate that into the wee hours of the night. Okay. Thank you, Allison. Sam? I think uh, Duncan makes a salient point that the uh, boundary should be the same 
but I do have some sympathy with the uh, the petitioner that the uh, you know they they want to develop the northern portion of that site. So I think regardless of what we do, uh, we should be forwarding it with the same boundary. Thank you, Sam. Daniel? I don't think I have anything that has already been covered, so no comments. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any additional comments on what my fellow commissioners have made. Um, so so can I clarify myself a minute? This is Duncan. Can I, can I clarify my comment? Yes, Duncan. My 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 point was that if the if it not not I don't I don't think it's important that the that the local designation and the national register nomination have the same boundary necessarily. I'm just saying that I was kind of tipping off the owner that that they're going to build a building inside a national register boundary, <laughs> and that means that they will be liable for federal endeavors, 106 review on anything that involves federal endeavors, including federal licensing, which covers most communication these days. So I, what I didn't, what I, what I don't know is what action the National Register would take once they were alerted to the fact that uh, the site, the local designation only encompasses, let's say the building footprint, um, I'm sure they don't want to have a have a, nom a, a national register listing that that is basically half parking lot if, as long as it, if, when it's not associated with the with the building anymore. So it, it's just a complicating factor. I'm, just, I'm not you know we could call the National Park Service and find out what they would do about it. But my my guess is they would they would vacate the national register nomination part that includes the parking lot and they would they would change their own footprint. That, that's that's my guess about what would happen, but I've just never had to I've just never had to administer that particular problem before. But I don't think the owner is probably going to want to build a building inside a national register nomination property until that's settled. So, and that said, I'm I'm pretty much okay with just doing the footprint of the building. Although, if you'll notice in the lower southeast corner, it it includes some vacant land that comes out to the street. So. It ought to include the sidewalk, at least on the south side, and you know maybe half of the alley, and then follow the footprint, foundation footprint at the back. Um, I, th I think, it, and also in, in terms of what Allison was proposing, it's better not to let the city council try to make a determination about the historic significance of the boundary. That's not their bailiwick. They, they want to know what we want to know. And normally when we forward something to them, we give them the boundary that we recommend and then it's it's theirs to change. We don't just tell them they have to decide. Okay. So there's just some areas up in the air here that I'm just, you know, that aren't aren't resolved. Okay, Mr. Patrick. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to see if I could uh, kind of ask a question relative to this, the boundary that we're discussing right now is, um, it, for us at least, it was a little unclear. And I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name's Joe Patrick and I'm with Peerless Development. Uh, I'm the director of development there. Um, I, it was a little bit unclear to us exactly where the boundary line came from. Um, it, which, uh, you know, I don't know if it was arbitrary to a certain degree, but that was kind of what prompted our request to say, look, if, if we're having this whole discussion about the building and knowing that the city council has already reviewed and, and actually approved the new development that is going to, uh, you know, likely to occur on the northern portion of the property. Um, and as part of that review that they've approved, it, it included, um, taking out and refurbishing the paving and some of the sidewalks and curbs and things along those lines that are just north of the existing building. We're trying to understand exactly how that connection between this boundary line, the new development and the existing building came about. And, and I don't know if somebody might be able to help clarify that for the group. I, I can clarify how the original national register boundary was drawn. It was just the property line right that, that makes sense but so this this orange boundary here isn't doesn't match the boundary line of the property 
So that's why I'm trying to, that's why I was trying to figure out where, you know, this division line that kind of cuts through, and I know it's, you know, tough on an image like this, but it kind of cuts through the um, the utility shed there that we're talking, the equipment shed, it kind of cuts through the smokestack um, and kind of just right through the middle of the parking lot. So I don't know where that, you know, came from or what, what drove it to be at that location, yeah. which is again, what prompted our request to try to have it follow the outline of the building a little more since that's what in our at least in our mind was part of the um the local local historic designation element it was really the building I not so much the paving and the sidewalk joseph can i respond sorry i didn't mean to yes. interrupt yes. yeah so um yeah i can respond to that and so backtracking a little we started by looking at the original boundaries of the national register of historic places which is the entire lot so um, that was taken into consideration but the fact that there is already an approved project for the parking lot and not and having the whole place and uh, the whole lot in a nomination process would be very complicated um, that sort of led to what seems like a very arbitrary division. Um, to clarify, most historic sites or districts, so here in Bloomington we call uh, individual building landmarks his, uh, single structure historic districts as well. They usually include the entire lot. So um, changes to fencing, changes to um, sidewalks and to other components of the sites are often looked at. However, that is not the exclusive boundary. Um, in accordance and agreement with the owners, the boundary can be the walls of the building itself. So there are various options. There is some flexibility to this. Um, and the reality is that we want to work with, in, in good faith with you and understand that this is a, an extraordinary, sorry, extraordinarily complicated lot in many ways. So this is the time um, for um, you as the owners, as Peerless, and the commission to decide what, what works best for the lot, um, works best for everybody, and, and sort of find a, a medium, um, a compromise that could work for the protection of the building, but also ensure um, that some of the uh, peer lists is your goals are also met. So that that was kind of the arbitrariness of this um, of th these lines. However, it doesn't have to remain at these at this line. Um, it can be determined right now that the building um, footprint itself is the historic district. But it's very normal and very typical in Bloomington for single building historic districts to include the entirety of the lot. So the grounds are also considered historic as well. Um, so it could go either way. It's a matter of having this conversation we're having right now. Did that help clarify your doubts? Uh, it did, and that's that's what, exactly what we were hoping for, which is why we kind of put forth the request, if if we could, you know, to the group to adjust it, especially the north the north boundary, because just to uh, you know reiterate a little bit, as part of the planned development on the northern half of the site, we will be, for instance, there's an existing transformer that's just north of the existing building, and we're we're going to be obviously tying into that with some of the new electrical work. You know, we're going to be reworking some of the curbs in the back there. We'll be, you know, reworking some of the paving and the striping. Um, so those, I mean, they may seem like minor items, but, you know, from our intent, it would be really much easier and much, I, I think, more beneficial for us, certainly as the owner, to not have to come back to the Historic Preservation Council for a special, uh, you know, certificate of, of appropriateness to move a curb or to tie in with a, an electrical transformer. So those that's that area is really, I think, the the biggest area that we are hoping to have the outline follow the profile of the building a little closer. Um, the the southern edge along Seventh Avenue, and somebody had mentioned half of the alley. I, I we I don't think we have any really particular. Um, uh, you know, opinion one way or another, however you guys would normally do it. But that, that area where we already know we're going to be proposing to do some um, work uh, related to the new development would be really beneficial to us to kind of have that follow the outline of the building along the northern edge there. Thank you. 
Um, so, um, should we um, now discuss the actual outline uh, that is presented to us now? Modify it or leave it as it is or move it closer? My concern is that we may have left something on the table, which is whether or not to forward it to the right, council. So I think what we're discussing right. at this point, if we forward it to the council, with the modification to the lot line. So we'll table this and move on to that discussion and then and go back to it. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I would propose we, we uh, make the boundary the footprint of the building. Uh, and as long as that also includes the footprint of the, the, the uh, smoke set, um, and I think the I, I appreciate Duncan's clarification, uh, and that makes a lot of sense. And you know, the petitioner has been advised uh, about the National Register boundary, and yeah, if they want a federal permit or uh, funding or something like that, the 106 will kick in, and they'll have to deal with that. Um, but for us, uh, for what I see, I think the the pertinent area is the uh, the footprint of the building. So I would suggest that we forward it to the council based on the footprint of the building. And so the only the only thing I, I see that complicates that in the nor, on the north side is there there are there's a lot of uh, access uh, uh, geometry there are walkways there are stairs there are approaches that are that are rightfully associated with the Johnson Creamery building and not associated with anything north of it so I would say not the footprint of the building but the outline of those sidewalks and curbs that that address the building. Uh, and I hate to say it, but including the electrical uh, uh, terminal there, because that is that was put in there in full service of the, of the Johnson Creamery building itself. I, um, that, that is actually part of the property. So, you know, I think you're going to have to include the sidewalks and walkways in the rear, um, as well as, as you say, some some reasonable area around the smokestack. Um, I guess I would, in, in terms of the city council, I would prefer to send them a map that we considered the, the best map in our, in, in our purview and let them approve it or disapprove it. Or then if they want to change it for some reason, uh, somebody can petition them to do that. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, Sam? It almost feels like we're, it almost feels like we're gonna have to walk the site with the owner and with us with a spray can or something, but we're gonna to have to get some, just some kind of on-site visual agreement to, for that boundary that we can bring to another meeting. Yeah. I don't think the footprint of the building is, is the, right, the right way to do it. Thank you, thank you, Duncan. Sam? Um, given Duncan's familiarity with uh, the building and the, uh, you know, the application for National Registry and all that. Uh, I was going to propose that we table this until he's had a chance to basically do what he just said, is walk the site with the, the owner and Gloria and uh, come up with a modified boundary that encompasses as tightly as possible those elements of the creamery, both uh, interior and exterior, that are uh, salient and historic and salvageable, uh, and that we just table this until that's done. I'm sorry, Sam. I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, you shall I make that a motion? Yes, please. Um, so moved. May staff make a comment? Sorry? Yeah, may staff make a comment? I don't know what the appropriate time is on the motion. May I make a comment on the possible motion, or do we want to wait until it's been made? Oh, he did. I'm happy to withdraw the motion until we get comments from staff and Anyone else, any public comment remaining? Okay. Um, well, I, I appreciate the discussion of the commission. I do want to advise um, from staff and I think from the administration that we are under some sense of urgency here uh, due to the safety of the smokestack, um, which is quite unsafe right now. If you saw the study, <clears throat> pardon me, in the uh, packet, uh, we have a, a trail closed uh, with a beeline and we are trying to get this uh, secured as fast as possible. And I worry, quite frankly, that if we wait, if we table this and don't determine a map tonight, some map that can be forwarded to the city council with designation, understanding the 
sort of conflict that we're in here, but I do, um, I do worry about the public safety here. And so I would, um, to the extent staff can do this, urge the commission to act tonight to make a recommendation if you choose a recommendation, um, because we are um, under a, a gun here on, on public safety. So um, just want to put that out there. Uh, and I think the study, the, the engineering report uh, that uh, discusses the, the condition of the smokestack um, would hopefully reinforce that. So I appreciate you hearing the staff's comment, and I mean it absolutely respectfully, uh, but I do want to just impress that that sense of urgency we have tonight, if I may. So I thank you. I draw that motion because I, I do concur that public safety trumps. Great. Could we make a, would there be a simple way to um, define the boundary as the footprint of the building plus sidewalk out to the street and then uh, along the back, uh, the footprint of the building plus a one meter buffer, I guess, oh, a yard buffer or something, would that be acceptable? And that would probably capture some of uh, Duncan's concerns about uh, streetscape and related sorts of things. Do the owners have comments on this, at the, on this proposal? I'm sorry? No. I mean, I, I feel like we've got a, a good actor here, um, and I'd, I'd like to work with them and, and also balance the time of the, uh, not have the smokestack fall on somebody. So um, uh, if that would work, I will move that. Okay. Then uh, why don't we make the motion that we move this to city council for designation? Daniel? There, uh, sorry, there's a resolution. Uh, do you have the resolutions with you? Oh, I don't have it. Sorry, Clark. What's the downside of using the proposed boundary that we've looked at first that's defined and is on the table uh, and has come from our staff? Well, I think it's. I don't see I a downside. I just trying to accommodate too far. Does anybody have a copy? Trying to compromise and accommodate the petitioner because it seemed like a reasonable request. I, I'll just jump in here again. I would make that north boundary just follow the configuration of the curb and, and public area associated with the creamery itself, you know, across the back and not, not, a, not a meter out, but just whatever that curb distance is. There's a fairly narrow sidewalk all the way to the entrance at the center of the building. And then there's a very wide apron that sweeps around and basically makes a beeline for the, for the uh, stack itself. And so it, it's a it's a it's a curved line, but it's a it, it takes in all of the, the public space associated with the creamery before you get to the parking lot, and, and and it's an easy line to follow. It's a curb. That sounds good to me. Uh, I, I'd be happy to move that that would be the boundary. Hi, um, I, our, our issue with that is that, that curb and that sidewalk and that configuration are, are all changing as, as part of the uh, proposed and approved plans for the new development. That's why, um, you know, we're, we're suggesting, I, I guess, you know, a foot around the, the base of the foundation or whatever, a yard or three feet around would probably work. And I think all of our changes will be outside of that. Um, but the configuration of the sidewalk as it is today will not be 100% the same. And that's, that's part of why we would like to just get it, you know, um, adjusted today uh, so that it, all of our modifications that we know are happening are outside of that and future repairs fall outside of it. Um, ad additionally, uh, I, we, we'd like to ask um, if we can get uh, HPC, the member of the um, commission's um, feedback on the chimney and the smokestack, um, you know, in light of the report that we have in our hands uh, and the public safety concern and staff's, you know, uh, urgency to get this taken care of, um, you know, we'd like to get sort of comments and feedback on our proposed plan of a, um, action, which would be to reduce the height to 60 feet. Well, 
We're not talking about the smokestack. No. No, that's not a part of this. That'll be, a, the smokestack is a different uh, uh, part that'll come later. Well, this is an urgent matter of public safety. Thank you. Great. Does staff, based on all of this discussion on the boundary line, do you have a suggestion as to um, the boundary line? Um, so, the issue with the boundary line is um, that what we're doing right now is um, negotiation that happens with many of these types of cases. Um, just trying to figure out what works best for every for the different parties um, involved, for the owners, and and there's going to be some give and take. So. In the end, um, the HPC has to decide um, which boundaries they're going to go with, and then the and send it to Common Council, and that's what's going to, yeah, um, that's what the Common Council is going to be looking at, and the owners also have a chance to voice their um, their either support or contest it in different ways um, at Common Council as well. Um, it's better if everybody's in agreement at this point as much as possible. So that's kind of where we're at. Sam? Sorry. Thank you, Gloria. I'll do it. I'm, I move that we send it in with this designated boundary and if the proponent wants to talk to the council about reducing it, the council can reduce it. So um, having thought this through, I, would, uh, I move we send it to the council as defined in the packet. I would second that motion. Not hearing. You need to unmute yourself, sir. Sorry. Um, so uh, today, the HPC Council declares that the property located at 700 West 7th meets the following criteria, criteria for uh, local designation referred to in the staff report. A, has significant character, interest, or value as a part of the development, heritage, or cultural characteristics of the city, state, nation, or associated with the person who played a significant role local, state, or national history, and the site is of an historic, uh, is of historic. Two, uh, is the site, uh, the, the site is of an historic event, and three, it exemplifies the culture, political, economic, social, or historic heritage of the community. Consequently, the HPC recommends historic designation under Title VIII of the Bloomington Municipal Code to the Common Council, with the attached map. Interim protection, the resolution to place interim protection on the property that has been sent to the Common Council with the recommendation of local historic de designation. Today, after a vote, the HPC recommends that the Common Council locally designate. Get your attention. Legal. These are, these are two separate uh, resolutions, so, so. I'm sorry, you're right, Dan, you're right, Daniel. So, I just want to make sure we didn't miss it because that happened to us in the past. No, I just want to clarify, there were two other um, points uh, under the architectural subsection that Gloria indicated in the staff report that I don't think were included in your resolution. Okay. I can. Here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Um, so number one will be, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this. Okay, number one, exemplifies the cultural, political, economic, social, or historic heritage of the community. Two, 
owing to its unique location of physical characteristics, represented an establishment and familiar, familiar visual feature of the city, or three, exemplifies the built environment in an area of history characterized by a distinctive architectural <laughs> style. Consequently, the HPC recommends is the historic designation under Title VIII. So, did you read those two? Well? I did. Okay. Yes. Um, Title VIII of the Bloomington Municipal Code to the Common Council with the attached map. Okay. And the commission? Second. Thank you. The? Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSaller? I'll abstain. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Motion carries. Second, interim protection. Resolution to place the interim protection on a property that has been sent to the Common Council with a recommendation of historic designation. Today, after a vote, the HPC recommends Common Council locally designate the property at 700 West 7th Street as historic and places the property under interim protection pending action by the Common Council under BMC 8.08.015. Good. Do we need a vote? Um, okay. Daniel, do we need a vote for this one too? Yes. All right. D? Okay. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSaller? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yep. John Saunders? Yes. Uh, Allison, Allison Chopra? Yes, right. ma'am. Motion okay, carry. motion carries. Good. All right. Thank you. Uh, any? Uh, um, so let's move on to uh, commissioner comments. I have some. Sh should I proceed? Yes, Chris. Okay. I remember that when this group first bought the first proposed their plans. They were planning to take the chimney down and they had an art installation that was going to take the place of the chimney. And just a historic note that without any engineering report, the chimney was, was threatened. And I think it was not agreed to at that time, but it was some kind of lighted art, art structure that was as tall as this chimney so they could keep the commitment to use the radio uh, antenna or whatever. So just for the public record. And then over on 16th Street, I wonder how many people noticed that arts and crafts bungalow that's being demolished by neglect at 16th and Lincoln. It's one of the nicest houses in that area. It's got a hole in the roof. Weeds are growing up around it. Uh, maybe uh, it's, I would might request staff to investigate the ownership of that and if there's any action we can take to help protect that pro that house. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, do we have any public comments? Uh, I'd like to speak again. Um, uh, we actually proposed that after we did have a, an engineering report, and it was apparent that the smoke tack stack was continuing to deteriorate. Um, so we weren't seeking to demolish. We came simply um, asking what everybody's thoughts were on that. I'm sorry, I didn't know that fact. Thank you for clarifying it. Thank no you. problem. John. Um, yes, Mr. Chair, I just want to express thanks to the commission, um, especially to Commissioner DeSaller. I didn't mean to interject in front of his motion. It's always hard to know the best time to interject as staff and so I appreciate you all willing to hear me out on on the urgency of the situation here um, so thanks um, also at the appropriate time uh, Daniel would like to talk through next steps here so once we uh, this moves to the council and sort of our timeline that we might be on here so whenever that's appropriate as well thank you all right Daniel uh, yeah thank you so 
Um, as you know, this is sort of the very first step in, in a process uh, for this property. The next step for, for this location will be to go to city council um, for the question of, of the map and the ordinance uh, that will be voted on as to whether to put this uh, under protection as a local historic district. Um, as, as has been talked about several times tonight, um, there is a rather pressing concern as it relates to uh, the condition of the smokestack, uh, and it's uh, currently under, um, as has been re referenced before, uh, an unsafe order under Indiana Code given its current condition um, and certain risks to public safety. Um, and kind of in light of all of, of what's going on um, and that, that concern about public safety, um, there is a procedural mechanism that permits uh, a petitioner to make a request for a certificate of appropriateness while the city council is considering uh, an actual map. And so that is something, a procedural mechanism that may come into place here, um, where the, uh, as the commissioners, you may be seeing um, a certificate of appropriateness and being asked to consider some options as it relates to, to making this uh, stack safe. Um, that, that certificate of appropriateness would not be, if granted or otherwise, um, would not be effective unless city council adopts an ordinance making uh, it a local historic district. Um, but, but that is a procedural mechanism that, that seems to be appropriate in this case, given some concerns that if it is uh, approved by council, there could be a path forward, at least in place, to begin work to, to make this safe sooner as opposed to waiting for the council to act, then coming back through this process after the fact. So um, procedurally, there may be some more things coming your way on that and, and some more important decisions to make in the near future. Are, aren't there ways, are there ways to make this safe without taking it down? They just cost more, isn't that right? Uh, I can speak to that if, if uh, you'd like or Um, uh, we may, I don't know when the best forum for that discussion is, if it's when we uh, consider a COA, um, uh, Commissioner Sturbaum, I would say right now that um, the, we don't believe, let me just say in, in summary, that we don't believe securing it now will help, um, will take any less time than what it would take to secure it long term, okay? so. There are really two options the structural engineer has identified for uh, stabilizing it, which involves steel framing uh, or more of a piping structure. Um, both of those costs and the time to get it done, the, the cost is, is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, as we have seen estimates on, and the timing would not, uh, we, we may very well run into, the, by the time that work gets, uh, all the due diligence done and, and the work could actually begin, we may be at a spot where uh, restoration work would have already begun. So I guess the uh, stabilization timeline would could stand in the way of long-term repair is what I'm trying to say. So uh, we could talk more about that at our next meeting as the COA comes forward, but that's the um, current assessment. We think a COA uh, is the best uh, place for this, which is why we encouraged action tonight so we could keep this moving, so. Thank, Thank you, you, John. Thank you. I move to adjourn. Second. That, that was my next one. <laughs> Is that? Thank you. Thank you, everybody.